Aaron, how's it going? Hey, what's up, Andrew? Everything is good, thanks. Good, good. Uh, so we're going to get into, we, we've discussed it a little bit, but we're going to get more into uh, the commercial claims side of it. Um, you know, first thing that comes to mind from our discussions is business interruption, which seems like a broad topic. But like, what what is, in a nutshell, like if, if a business is getting insurance through you, um, and they're going to be filing claims, uh, business, I imagine business interruption is like, you know, where it all starts. So if we break down commercial insurance, basic commercial business owners policies, there's two pieces to it. There's the property piece, which is your business, personal property, your equipment, your inventory, and then, uh, and your buildings. And then there's a liability piece, which is the bodily injury, property damage to, to others. You know, those are the two main pieces, the business interruption piece falls under the property policy. So small business owners that are say landscapers, small contractors, typically only have the general liability piece and not the property piece. So they don't have any business interruption coverage uh, because they're not physically tied to a physical location where they could be shut down and have those issues. So there's a lot of, you know, <clears throat> missing pieces with respect to business income, but those places that do have physical locations, the, the restaurants, the professional office, the landlords, right? And, you know, business interruption is key because we rely on the public to come into our space. And that's kind of where the business income falls in. Now, in most policies, the business income requires a covered cause of loss covered cause of loss, the easiest one is fire, right? Mm -hmm. Fire, theft, vandalism, automatic sprinkler, discharge um, in certain buildings. Um, these are the things that would typically trigger a business interruption claim, right? How do we get the building rebuilt so that you can inhabit it again and then bring the public back in to then create revenue once again. When somebody gets hurt, uh, you know, on your property, somebody's performing work around your building and they get hurt, um, what kind of coverage, you know, somebody gets hurt, you know, are, are we talking like lawsuit and that's where the insurance comes in or it covers their hospital? How does that all work? Well, when it comes to somebody getting hurt, it depends on who that somebody is uh, as to where it's gonna be covered. So if we look at the types of somebody's the types of people in and around any type of commercial building you have your guests um you know who are guests of leaseholders guests of the building owner there because it's a public space right those guests those third parties those would be covered under the general liability policy for the landlord or the leaseholder um, and then there's lease language you know that indemnifies each other should a situation arise more often than not, there's some kind of negligence that has to go into to these. You know, restaurants are, are high, high targets for high traffic, slip and falls. Uh, there was water on the floor. I slipped and fell. I broke my hip. Um, I had to get taken in an ambulance. And then, you know, I, I'm no longer able to perform my normal function of life. And my future life has been affected. And therefore, I'm going to sue you. So on a commercial liability piece, the coverage comes in in most cases when the lawsuit comes in there's a duty to defend for the for the leaseholder for the building owner for the tenant for the business um, and the insurance company provides that defense on their behalf for that lawsuit so we see it a lot in large office buildings we see it a lot in the hospitality sector where people get hurt for slip and falls and you know, different accidents can can arise. Other people on the property would be employees that would be covered under the workers' compensation policy. If an employee slips and falls a little bit during the course of their work, they would be covered. Then there's the contractors, right? If the contractor or subcontractor performing work on the building gets hurt in and around the building, again, it would fall up to that contractor and their workers' compensation policy even though in some cases they will sue the landlord to try to get additional compensation for some form of negligence. Um, and it all depends on what kind of language is in the lease, whether that's gonna be covered or not. When it comes to the commercial side of things, you have f like 40 different types of commercial insurance. Mm -hmm. um, why are there so many different types of commercial? Shouldn't everything kind of be covered under general liability? You know, the general liability is just that, it is general, right? Mm -hmm. When we speak to a new business owner, we always start with the general. How can we 
make this as broad as, as possible. But depending on the business, we have different types of coverage that are gonna be better to protect certain businesses, right? So if we go into um, a restaurant that serves liquor, well, we wanna make sure we add liquor liability. We also wanna make sure that we add assault and battery coverage. Um, and we wanna make sure we add food spoilage coverage. So there's three additional coverages right off the top of my head that we would add to a hospitality style location. So we wanna protect the owners from that liquor liability, we wanna protect the product from spoilage should the power go out for uh, any unforgiven, unforeseen accident circumstance. Um, and you know, if a fight does break out because we are serving alcohol, we wanna make sure there's coverage in place for that assault and battery. Um, and the other big one for hospitality we like to add is the employment practices liability. That EPLI you know, protects the owners from their employees and from the general public for harassment, wrongful termination, um, and other kinds of lawsuits, you know, that, that could arise. Discrimination, uh, disability, a, age, you know, disability of related claims, if it's the building's not accessible, um, age discrimination for any type of prospective employee. So there's a lot of different things that employment practices liability will protect you from as well. But then if we switch over to the professional side, the insurance agents, the accountants, the lawyers, <clears throat> architects, engineers, we want to make sure that we're protected for the work that we perform. We provide a service. Um, we provide product. We provide drawings. We provide advice. And if we give wrong advice and we get sued for giving wrong advice, we want to have the insurance in place to protect us for that. So depending on the industry, you know, there's going to be lots of different types of specialty insurance that we can help protect people with. You know, we can also dive into the alcohol world of distribution and production. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that there's product liability included in there. You know, any types of manufacturing, we want to have product liability covered. We also want to have, if a production error occurs, we want to have coverage for that production error. So we want to make sure for all the breweries, the distilleries, and anybody else out there in types of manufacturing and distribution, that we are covered for the spoilage, the product recall, and that product liability as well, should something go wrong with it. So uh, you mentioned uh, uh, breweries, um, you know, not only are they, you know, possibly serving alcohol, but they're also manufacturing or producing alcohol. Is that liquor liability? What, what, is, what is it like on a production side? What, what would a brewery have to have to concern themselves with? So we always want to have the liquor liability with anything related to alcohol, whether you're manufacturing and distributing or you're serving, you know, more importantly, obviously, when you're serving it, mm -hmm. when you're manufacturing a product, any kind of product, but it, namely, you know, alcohol, uh, beer and spirits, we want to have that production coverage. We want the product liability in place in case the product is spoiled. We also want to have that product recall in place. If a product is spoiled, and an issue arises and we need to pull all that product from the shelves of the retailers and the other places that are distributing it, there's a huge expense associated with pulling that product from the shelves and also making that product over again. So the product recall and the product liability are gonna help with respect to, to that, to pulling the product off of the shelves, remanufacturing and restocking those shelves is, is where it's gonna come into play. The liquor liability with respect to the breweries, the brew pubs and the distilleries is for serving and distributing. Um, you know, I drink too much on any of my favorite spirits. I get into a major accident, something happens. You know, everybody gets named in a lawsuit. So it doesn't hurt to have that extra layer of coverage should a situation arise. Food spoilage, when we talk about it on like a personal, uh, on a personal insurance, personal claims, you know, it's like, don't, you know, don't, you know, usually nine times out of nine, you're not going to be like, oh, you know, claim that because your food spoilage, you know, it's going to make your your uh, your insurance go up and it's just not really worth it. But when we're talking about it, say on a distribution side or on a production side, you know, you could be losing like forty thousand dollars worth of product Are, is spoilage. Then uh, is it is it by law a necessity? Have you ever experienced it where you've you've brought it to a, a company, you've brought it to a manufacturer somewhere, a food a food place um, and they didn't get this stuff is this is this something that is just a no-brainer when people just need to get this 
It's insurance, so there's no such thing as as a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, people think it's too expensive. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you know, we're often called as insurance agents that we're you know just above used car salespeople. <laughs> um, you know, the bottom of the barrel when it comes to it. But at the end of the day, we think we do a lot of good. Uh -huh. We make a lot of recommendations, and we're gonna you know do what we can do to help people make the best decisions they can for their business. Mm -hmm. But with respect to the spoilage, I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. But to me, a lot of insurance is is a no-brainer. We definitely don't use that food spoilage coverage on a homeowner's policy. It's not worth that two hundred and fifty dollar or five hundred dollar check to have that go against you. But when we're talking ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars of spoilage. It's it's a different ball game uh, when it when it comes to it. So the restaurants and the manufacturers um, and the large distributors need to have that coverage on hand. Oftentimes, it's a limited coverage, so we need to review the availability of being able to purchase higher limits of the food spoilage coverage, depending on the type of business. But oftentimes, we're limited to the five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars of spoilage because the insurance companies know that the claims will come in and they want to limit their exposure on the high side to, to not have to, to pay the whole bill when it when it comes down. So that's definitely something that's part of the negotiation. Mm -hmm. And a good insurance agent is going to look for those higher limits, offer those higher limits, and then let the business owner make the ultimate decision of, okay, if we have a loss, I can take X amount of risk on my own, and then I want to buy insurance to cover the other half of that risk, whatever it may be. Uh you know, if somebody gets hurt on your property and they sue you, obviously you need insurance for that. But what I didn't realize was that, you know, even if a third party is like trespassing on, on a, say a job site for a construction company, or even like, uh, you know, at your facility, whatever it is, and they get hurt, you, you could be on the hook for that. So is, is that, how is that covered? What is that called? And that's, I'm assuming, is, is it part of general liability? Yeah, so if any kind of third party, whether they're trespassing, they're a visitor, they're a guest, they're invited or they're not invited, if they get hurt on your work site or on your property, there could be a liability exposure there. Um, you know, it depends on if we can add comparative negligence into this. But again, that becomes a court decision and the duty to, to defend will be there because I, I can bet you that some lawyer, any, you know, not any lawyer, some lawyer will pick up that case if somebody does get hurt on your property. Mm -hmm. Depending on what's going on at the property would depend on who's liable. So when I buy a piece of dirt, I hire a contractor to build me a house. Um, the contractor has liability, but I am also required as a homeowner, as a landowner, to have liability as the owner. The contractors, you know, and many people think that the contractor's liable, you know, 24 seven, 365, but that's not necessarily true. The contractor's liability ends when the job site is closed for the day mm -hmm. and closed for the weekend or closed for the holiday. So somebody comes on my property on a Sunday and my property is not properly secured and gets hurt. Well, the contractor can get sued, but the homeowner can get sued, you know, and the, the homeowner landowner, I keep interchanging that. Mm -hmm. uh, again it's the duty to defend that's going to be the biggest expense when it comes to it now is the contractor liable on sunday for the property probably not mm -hmm. it's the homeowner that's going to have the liability onus put on them for that injury that occurs off hours while the con general contractor is not on site and not working mm -hmm. so it's always better that everybody has that liability coverage when it comes to you know work being performed on any kind of job site liability often flows up. So if I'm a building owner, I hire a contractor, contractor hires a subcontractor and so on and so forth. Everybody needs to have the same and the correct and the proper insurance in place so that if an itch situation arises, that the landowner ultimately gets protected and then the general contractor gets protected above that. So we wanna make sure all the layers are in place and all the language is put into the lease and into the contract between the owners and the contractors to indemnify and, and protect all the way up, you know, all the way up the ladder. So uh, bringing it up to, uh, you know, the, the times that we're living in, we talked about this a little before, but like government shutdown and insurance, um, is it, is it kind of like is it too, is it too late like if, if businesses want to get 
wanted to get covered because we don't know what the future holds at this point in time is it kind of too late to get insurance for you know for anything and i don't even know what the instances would be exactly to be covered uh you know for what's going on with the pandemic and the government shutdown but like what kind of insurance would a business need to get and is it too late to get that insurance at this point so any any business needs to get the business the insurance that's proper for that business and for themselves as owners doesn't matter what time we're in during this covid era um, businesses still need to have general liability they still need to have property coverage they still need to have business interruption because that that fire that claim that other situation could arise you know the government shut down if we get the pandemic reinsurance program up and running off the ground it's a federal program that's going to date back if something does happen it's going to go back to what insurance you had in place in march so no reason to dwell on on the past only to look forward to see what's what's next um employment practices liability and cyber liability are a little bit of a challenge right now the the hacks and the ransomware and everything going on are are incredible the terminations and the lawsuits are incredible right now so it is a little bit challenging for certain classes of business to get cyber um, and to get employment practices. When it comes to cyber, it's do you have the firewalls? Do you have the protocols? Are you have two-step authentication in place? Have you had a breach or a claim in the past? These are the questions that are gonna have to be answered before we can go ahead and, and purchase uh, a cyber liability policy. With respect to the employment practices liability policy, again, industry specific, have you had a policy in the past? Why don't you have a policy? Uh, why are you just purchasing a policy today? Have you had any terminations? Is your staff downsized more than 25%? Are you planning to upsize? Is your business growing? Like there's a lot of questions that come from the underwriters uh, to get that employment practices liability, but many classes of business like hospitality um, are, are shut down with respect to purchasing new EPLI policies if you didn't have one before. However, if we have some markets that are willing to provide coverage, they would just put a start date on it today and not have any retroactive coverage available for those people that wish to purchase that. that so it's it's always better, you know, to not assume anything. Get on the phone with LG Insurance, get on the phone with Aaron uh, and, and talk to you because there's got to be, you know, there's something you could work out, you know, whether it's, you know, the exact thing you were thinking or, or coverage that you probably weren't aware of. It's better to just get on the phone with somebody that knows insurance and can help as opposed to just assuming this stuff is what I'm gathering. <laughs> Don't assume that because you bought a cheap policy on the, the internet that you're going to be covered for anything that you're busy. <laughs> right? That's the assumption we need to stop making. Uh -huh. um, we need to also stop making the it's not going to happen to me assumption because it's happened to you uh -huh. um, and it's happening to everybody right now. <laughs> so it, it's just important to talk to somebody and, and have the conversations, learn about where the risks are from a professional and then and then decide how much coverage you want to take and how much risk you want to take on your own. Right? As a business owner, we're taking a risk to make profit. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's protect whatever risk we're taking to make that profit to protect us from the unforeseen accidents that can and will occur. Um, and it's an ongoing business expense that doesn't ever go away. Insurance is an expense just like taxes and your utility bills and everything else that goes along with it. It is a normal operating expense that should be in every business plan.